Welcome to the More Perfect Union, a podcast about the joy we get from American politics, or as we call it, real debate without the hate. Hi there, I'm DJ McGuire from Suffolk, Virginia, and I'm your neoconservative libertarian for the evening. Hi, I'm Greg Matuzek. I'm your liberal Democrat from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm Cliff Dunn. I'm a Republican from Virginia. And I'm Kevin Kelton. I'm a Democrat from the moderate side of the party, and I live in Los Angeles. And with over 35,000 downloads a month, A More Perfect Union is one of the leading political podcasts on iTunes. A More Perfect Union can also be found on iHeartRadio and on Facebook at facebook.com slash moreperfectunionpodcast. Please share our link on your Facebook newsfeed and tell your friends to give us a listen. So, gentlemen, with one week to go before the first debate of the uh, campaign season, what are the topics that you'd like to talk about tonight? We've had a lot going on this weekend, and uh, very sadly, there were um, some terrorist attacks in New York City this weekend. And I think we should discuss how they're going to affect the campaign. Well, I think the first thing we the, the first thing we should say is, from what I have seen, uh, no one has actually died as a result of these attacks, which is a plus. There are injuries; those injuries are unfortunate, but apparently none of them have been fatal. Last I heard, so that's a good thing. No one has claimed responsibility for this. Daesh has not. Al Qaeda has not. There was some bizarre thing on Tumblr where some where somebody, some apparent left wing social justice warrior, claimed that he or she was responsible. The last I read, ironically from the British Daily Mail, was that police are discounting that, saying no, we don't really think that's relevant here. So uh, it's a situation where we really, we until we know more about who actually did this and what their motivations were. I don't think we really say what kind of effect this will have one way or the other. The, the more things are unsettled, the more it hurts Hillary Clinton. That's just from, from pure political perspective. But again, until we know who's responsible, I think it's difficult to say the impact one way or the other. Yeah, I, I don't think there's going to be that much of an impact on the campaign. And, and as usual, trying to disentangle a one-point hit to Hillary from this and a one-point hit from Lay to Flora Bull is probably not going to be an easy task. So what do you think about the fact that before we knew anything, when it was just an explosion, Trump himself said, well, we have a bomb. And he actually used the word bomb. And Clinton had said, we need more information before I'm going to comment about it. And I think it speaks a lot about the temperament and the choices about these two candidates. I mean, he was right in front of a crowd. I'm going to do something I may have never done on this show before. Do gonna, not defend Trump. I'm going to. Do not to. defend Trump. What is My wrong with him world saying world there was a bombing? There was a bombing. I just don't – literally, yeah, I don't yeah, understand there was, it. There was, there was, there was a bombing. There was, it, there was no information given about that. It was, was, it was an, an explosion. explosion and, well, that's a bombing. But he, how, how did – wait, it could have been a gas leak. How did no, he know it, it happened a, in a dumpster. They no. knew within 15 minutes no. there was a bombing. Come on. It is at least reasonable to presume that if a, an explosion goes off in a dumpster, it was probably a bomb, not yeah. an exploding cow. <laughs> yeah, this is – listen to the folks who grew up in the New York area. Trump did not necessarily jump to conclusions as much as he took a, a big step to one, and it's not really something that is going to hurt him at the end of the day. It's not really – it's not really much of a big issue. And no, it also no. says something to the, na- to the nature of the two candidates. Trump leads with his chin a lot. Hillary Clinton doesn't, and we saw that here. But the little right. fact of the matter is, by the time the uh, the Chelsea dumpster blew up, there was already an explosion in New Jersey that messed up a race that was scheduled for that day. Yeah, so, they had to cancel the Marine Corps uh, marathon up there, or 5K exactly. up there. Exactly. Right. And from what I'm reading, they are now fairly certain, not entirely certain, but they're fairly certain that they're related. So for Trump to assume and then state that it was a bomb is not really that much of a leap. So that I don't really think that is as, that is as much of a of a big deal. Yeah, you know, it seems to me it's very simple. Trump, as DJ said, came to an early conclusion and was proven right. Just like he came to the early conclusion that President Obama was indeed a citizen of the United States, and he was right. <laughs> No, he, he, you- he came to a conclusion about that, and then he lied about his conclusion <laughs> four years ago. And he's now just he, – he waited until one he waited until one of his hotels was about to open and needed some publicity. But he decided, oh, now's a good time for me to say I think the president was born in the United States because I've got a hotel to open. Hillary started which it, was- and he ended it. <laughs> That's, that was the worst part about the – about the Trump announcement was that he had to blame 
Hillary for everything. I was like, oh, wow, Trump's standing up and doing the right thing. Good for him. Good on him. (laughs) I I will say two things. One, the simple fact of the matter is, while the Clinton campaign may have have had nothing to do with the initial to-do on the president's first place, it was a Clinton supporter who first tried to bring this to the fore. Are you talking about Cindy Blumenthal? I'm talking about early Tate, whatever early her name Tate is. Early Tate was not a Clinton supporter. Yes, she was. She was, she was yes, a she supporter. Yes, she was. She was in 2008. I right, didn't say she was. She was I did not say she was affiliated she wasn't with, with the campaign. campaign. Right, right, I didn't right. say that. That's fine. Trump, Trump conflated that. But also, Trump politically had to do that because he, he, he had to essentially beat up Hillary Clinton because while he <laughs> was, before he did that the day before, he essentially once again reminded everyone that he doesn't care about limited government, that he's the party of big government for white people guy, by basically saying that he wanted Medicaid expanded, which essentially is Obamacare minus the corporatized insurance, right? and that he is willing to use unemployment insurance to fund maternity leave, which is not what it's supposed to do, which will probably bankrupt the damn thing. He further then compounded the disaster with a child care tax credit scheme that looks like a frickin' Jenga puzzle. <laughs> All you have to do, if you if, if you are trying to find a way to help folks with childcare expenses while at the same time not discriminate against stay-at-home mothers or telework parents, et cetera, et cetera, the simple way to do that is to expand the child tax credit that was put in place earlier. Just expand it. It's very simple. And it is typical of the way Donald Trump has run this campaign, which is throw out a bunch of flaming, rabid, rancid rhetoric on the assumption that all conservatives are just racist bigots, and then throw out all this government expansion stuff to appeal to moderate Republican centrists. And that, frankly, this is the kind of thing that led me to leave the party in the first place, in that it essentially is, it has become a party where it's, it, it is essentially racism and Rockefellerism mixed into one. That's the Republican Party of today. Trump embodies it. I want no part of it. Okay, I'm going to interrupt. One, I think I heard that same speech by Hillary at a private. Like, some, she used, instead of racism and Rockefeller, she used basket of deplorables. But that's okay. Um, yes, which was two, such a charming line. Her reporters nice think it thing. was a charming line. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we think the 50% was too low. That's all. Hey, Cliff, what do you think of the Medicare and uh, Medicaid and child care um, aspect of Trump's new Love can I say scam? Hear. Can I say scam? <laughs> Let's be polite I, I, and call I was it a con. Say grift. Is grift, grift okay? Yeah, grift. Uh, I like grift. grift. Um, I prefer the term platform, but that I, th- I think the two terms <laughs> up most years anyway. Um, okay. I I I I, th- I think you can make a case that the child care tax credit thing is perhaps overly complicated. I do like the maternity leave, and to the extent that there's the argument that it discriminates against this group or that group, that's I would actually say more a problem with the electorate writ large, where there's a I would say broadly speaking, there's a concept on the electorate that maternity leave is a thing that because that was what was being ar- that's what's been argued for for a very long time democrats came out in favor of it some time ago i believe um so the push has been for maternity leave the fact that the popular conception is that mom takes care of the kids is not a fault of the campaign it is a, if if it is a fault at all it is a fault in society as a whole so, so so you're really telling me cliff that the proper thing to do is to just give up on that don't bother finding a way to let companies have more flexibility in terms of telework policy, in terms of in terms of employee flexibility and stuff. No, no, no. The better thing to do is just to impose something and then have it funded through an ins- through an insurance plan that should be private anyway, but is was never intended to handle anything like maternity leave. It's for unemployment insurance. It's already been expanded too much to include unemployment benefits to go well beyond what it's supposed to do, which essentially help bridge people from one job to another. But now you want to expand it into something where no one actually is unemployed, but they're they're in a situation where they have a new entrance into the family by saying, no, we are going to take something from the 20th century and simply impose it on 20th century firms and use a 20th century funding scheme that is already in trouble and actually expand that scheme and make it even creakier and less financially stable. You're telling me that's a good thing? 
I think what DJ's really asking for is maybe a new department, like a department of education, but more of like a department of family leave is what you're asking to be created. Because what we need is more departments in edu- <laughs> in the government. Ooh, yes. <laughs> DJ's going to agree with that. Yes, for us, for us, DJ, we should have an entire department to sort out what sorts of nuances we can encourage companies to adopt, and maybe some of them will adopt it or not. Yes, it's called the uh, Department of Administrative Affairs, and I have just the man for it, James Hacker. Let's get him. <laughs> oh, wait, no. Uh, um, no but ser- seriously, this is there is this assumption, and Trump has basically swallowed it, that firms are all stuck in the 1970s where they assume women are supposed to be barefoot and pregnant and that even if you hire someone, you're going to have to have this risk of this risk that she's going to be gone for six to eight weeks or whatever, or whatever it is for maternity leave. And we have to account for that. Firms are people, you know, as, as, as Mitt Romney said, corporations are people. They're 21st century people. (laughs) They recognize that they want to, that, that to get a productive workforce, they have to take into account work-life balance. They are making strides to take into account work-life balance. That includes things like schedule flexibility, like teleworking, things that this policy seems to deny the existence of. And that's yes, my problem. It is a 20th there. century solution to a 21st century issue. Those firms out there, though, clearly aren't taking into account when you consider the fact that there is a, I will say, standing stereotype, and it's not entirely unjust, uh, unjustified based on statistics, that if a woman has a child, she's going to be out of the workforce for a couple of weeks, and that can be crippling to, a, for example, a career as a lawyer. So you get women who basically have to choose, do I want to have a high-powered legal career, or do I want to have a child or two? Oh, I don't know about that. I, I think that those days of you having to choose is ridiculous. I mean, I that's, that's very outdated. I mean, I, I I don't think so. At least not in certain corners of the uh, corporate, legal, banking, etc. world. I don't think that is outdated. But and you're, you're, you're now you're now saying just, like using for a certain... funding mechanism, DJ. I'm trying to think of the last funding mechanism that has actually held up Social Security. The Social Security funding has already been raided to no end. The Highway Trust Fund is being cross-funded with general fund money every other year because the Highway Trust Fund is going bankrupt again and again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't speak to the liquidity uh, of those programs. It speaks to how the Congress is raiding funds that were otherwise sound. So the solution now is for the is for Donald Trump to raid fund that that would would be otherwise sound. Why so because stop, Congress is doing it, it's okay for Trump to do it. Is that what I'm hearing? Come on now. Why don't we no seriously? Why don't we stop pretending that all these funds are sacred little pots because we know that some future Congress will come in inevitably, or the pot will not be big enough, and money will have to come from somewhere else because a Congress has shown an incredibly it's an incredible track record of not guessing how much money is needed for a given program. <laughs> so wh- why don't we stop pretending that? I was going to say, if you're willing to expand that beyond this discussion and just replace everything that's out there with a negative income tax, I'm more than willing to listen. <laughs> and uh, Cl- <laughs> Cliff said something a couple of moments ago. He said that uh, having a baby or two could be detrimental to a woman's career as a lawyer. You know what could be even more detrimental to someone's career as a lawyer? Running for president. Because Hillary Clinton <laughs> has apparently become the least liked human being in the world. And a lot of Democrats I'm talking to this week are saying, what did this woman ever do to become so despised by so many people? We are scratching our heads trying to figure out how this campaign got to the point where millennials especially have just cut themselves off from this woman to the point where um, Bernie Sanders this week has reinstituted himself into the presidential campaign. He's been on a couple of TV shows talking about how important it is for his supporters to back Hillary Clinton. He did a couple of campaign events in Ohio. I think one had to be canceled for lack of interest. Uh, The ones that he was at had very small turnouts in the hundreds as opposed to in the thousands. And I'm starting to wonder whether Sanders has any influence over millennials in terms of moving them back to Clinton. Now, do you think it might be the millennials are angry or resent Sanders for not continuing with his race, for not going independent, for not going rogue, whatever, for letting him down or if they feel betrayed? 
I don't think it's just that. I think it's that you had a lot of people who came in and who were supporting him and the package that he offered. And they don't see Hillary Clinton as offering the same package, rightly or wrongly. And so it's one thing for Sanders to be out there, I'll say, selling himself as the candidate, and entirely another for him to be running around trying to sell the candidate that he spent the better part of a year bashing up you know, while he was running against her. We have to remember when we talk about millennial voters not necessarily liking Clinton. We also have to realize that they're not exactly fond of Trump either. I'm looking here at the 2012 exit poll, which showed 37 percent of voters under 30, which would be about the millennial generation as of 2012, 37 percent of them voted for Mitt Romney. According to the Quinnipiac poll, which is the latest one that I've seen, only 26 percent of voters under 35 are voting for Trump at this point. The simple fact of the matter is millennials are more open to other options. They are less tribalist and less binarist about the two-party system than, say, the rest of us. Their main experience with the two-party system has been this. Either the two parties are at loggerheads all the time, or on occasions where they do work together, they get things like the $700 billion bank bailout, which none of them like for obvious reasons. So the simple fact of the matter is they don't like when the two parties oppose each other. They don't really like when the two parties work together. They just don't like the two parties at all. That's why we're seeing Johnson getting 29% in the Quinnipiac poll and even Jill Stein getting 15%. They just, they look at the two oh, parties millennials, you mean. and they just don't like either of them. Millennials, yes. But they, here's they, the thing, they just don't like either of them. And this is the chicken and the egg argument that I see over and over again on Facebook, which, you know, uh, in my group, and our group, Open Fire, where people are discussing this every day. W- what I'm seeing is people like me are saying, Sure, I get it. Yes, maybe the two-party system is dysfunctional. Maybe you'd like a third choice. But only two people have a chance of becoming the next president. Only two people who are on the ballot have a chance of winning 270 electoral votes. And if you're not voting for Hillary Clinton, you're helping Donald Trump. If you're not voting for Donald Trump, you're helping Hillary Clinton. Kevin, that only, uh, and my apologies for the interruption, But that only works if you're talking about voters on the very far left who are voting for Jill Stein or voters very heavily on the right who are looking for for Gary Johnson because they're upset because they're never Trumpers. For folks who are in the center, and we have to remember, not all millennials are are, are left leaning. There are quite many who are center who are right leaning. The simple fact of the matter is, for a number of them, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are equidistant from them on either side, and they don't like either of them. The people that you're addressing on Open Fire, and I've seen a lot of this, are generally to your left. They're upset at Clinton and they're voting for Jill Stein. The folks who are to your right, you're not winning over with that argument because they look and they go, Hillary Clinton is over there. Donald Trump is over there. I don't like either. Either of them are about as equidistant for me on policies. I think they will do equal amount of damage, admittedly different damage. I'm voting for somebody else because I don't like either of them. And you're not getting the notion that you're seeing among the lefties, which is, yes, Donald Trump is much worse than Hillary Clinton, but that's not what some, that's not what a lot of the Johnson voters are about. The Johnson voters are about, neither of these people are good to me. Neither of these people are close to me on issues. It does not matter to me which one wins because for different reasons, they're both unacceptable and they're equally unacceptable. I w- I'd like to point out also that the large bubble among younger voters for J- Johnson and Stein has been mirrored in the last couple of cycles in large bubbles for of support for Ron Paul and um, and Bernie Sanders. So it, I, I think there is a broad disaffection among the youth and simply having a candidate that they supported come out and say, hey, support this major party candidate who I who I'm backing is just not enough for them. I know the Paul family could not bring their voters over to Mitt Romney in 2012. They just couldn't do it. <laughs> so, do you think? Do you think that these guys, these millennials, in the next two election cycles, do you think they'll? I, I hate to use this word because it sounds condescending. Grow up and find a major party candidate. I mean, will they eventually disseminate and say, "Oh, we're going to to settle in on a major candidate, on a major well, party," or know, do you that, think you see that these millennials? It depends on who that major party candidate is. If Bernie Sanders were to run again in four years and get the nomination, then yes, they'd be happy with a, a Democratic okay. nominee. 
the and that's what that drives I, me nuts because they're not voting party; they're voting presidents. And where in years past we've seen like, oh, we vote senators, congressmen, and things like this. Where in the past we've seen younger people get more interested. There's been a less and less interest in politics, and now it's every four years they vote for a president, they put it away. Till the next beauty pageant in four years, and they're like, "Oh, this is interesting now." But hang, hang and on, that Greg, that is not a problem that is simply limited to voters under thirty-five. We see that in our age groups. I see that in older voters, where the only thing they notice is the presidential election, and they don't pay attention to the rest of it. As for the voters under thirty-five, it depends on who wins, and it depends on what they do, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we are seeing is that voters under thirty-five. Are willing to cons- are are just as willing to vote libertarian certainly as they are Republican or Democrat. Whether that holds beyond 2016 remains to be seen. If it does hold beyond 2016, and that's an if, mind you, but if it does, then you really could have a, sis- a situation where one of the two major parties gets replaced in the binary system. I expect it's the Republicans because, frankly, they're in a lot more trouble than the Democrats right now. But you really could see that if the voters who are, who, are, who are supporting Johnson stay with him until November, as I hope they do, and stay with the Libertarian Party beyond 2016. If they do, we could have a major political shakeup in the next, over the next generation. If they don't, then we go back to form, unfortunately, in my opinion. I, I think there's one thing y'all are underestimating, and that is for people – I'm 29 – for people, quote, unquote, my age – all they've known in their adult life is a series of meh economies. The Bush administration ends in a bust, and the last eight years, it hasn't trickled down to them. You've got a lot of people who are my age who are you know, stuck doing continual part-time work, et cetera, et cetera. If you get to a point where the economy you know, rebounds sufficiently that they get their 40 hours a week job you know, paying enough to afford a car and a house and so forth – I think this goes away. If we have another four, eight, 12, 16, God help us, 20 years of this just rolling forward through the economy because of various transitions, I do suspect that you're going to see these voters are not going to settle down in a major party. Or they're going to create a new major party. They're going to turn one of the minor parties into a major party and knock one of the major parties into a minor party. Okay, so I want to respond to that and I want to circle back to what DJ said about two minutes ago. First of all, if the Libertarian Party, let's say Trump loses, the whole Republican Party implodes, and somehow the Libertarian Party becomes that new alternative, it will just absorb the Republicans, and it will be de facto the Republican Party that we've had for the last 30 years. So nothing's going to change there. If, on the other hand, Trump wins, and the and let's say the Green Party does much better than expected, and the Democratic Party implodes, the Green Party is is not going to become you know one of the two major parties because by definition it's a single issue organization its name is a single issue organization so the idea that we're going to in the next 4 or 8 years morph into the democrats and the new party or the republicans and the new party in my opinion is a fallacy but i have to, i have to correct you on that one because a lot of democrats in the 1860s and 70s saw the republicans essentially the new Whigs, but they weren't. They were a different party with different objectives. There were different. They had different priorities. If the libertarians, yes, but they did have a large portion of the same core platform. They, 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 and they. I'm not disputing that. But the Whigs were far more questionable on slavery than the Republicans were. For example, the Republicans and the Whigs had entirely different monetary uh, policy positions. The Republicans were far more amenable to Jackson hard money than the Whigs ever were. Uh, there were certain social issues that the Whigs talked about, that the Repu- like temperance and alcohol, that the Republicans ignored for generations. The Libertarians are going to have different priorities from the Republicans. You're not going to see the same emphasis on social issues. You're going to see differences of opinion on social issues. You're going to see differences on immigration policy. You're going to see differences on trade policy as the Republicans have gone more protectionist. You're going to have a lot of Republican voters, and you're going to see there is there is some overlap between Republicans and Libertarians as is. But the Libertarians won't be just the new Republicans. They will be a different party with different objectives. That's all I just want to say here. Okay, and I want to just wrap up this topic with one thing circling way back to when DJ first responded to my observation about the election. DJ, you're right. 
There are people who are libertarians who are moderate Democrats or moderate Republicans, but I was talking about that portion of that group that is on the far left or the far right. And if we can assume that between Johnson and Jill Stein, let's say there's 12 or 15 percent of the voting public that might go for one of them, that equates to somewhere around 15 to 20, 25 million people. My math is a little loose, but you know where I'm going with this. And all I'm saying is, if you take half of those, if it's just 10 million people, and if most of them are on the left who are going to deny Hillary Clinton the liberal votes that would otherwise go to a Democrat, that's the difference in the election. Now, it's true. The same can be said on the right. If there's a certain amount of the typical Republicans who would normally vote for the GOP candidate who are going to deny Trump their vote because they distrust him or they wanted a a more pure conservative, that could cost him the election. What I'm hoping is, is that those people hold out and vote for Gary Johnson, like you plan to do, DJ, and the people on the left all come back into the Hillary Clinton fold. To me, that would be a fair outcome. <laughs> it's, it's, I would still say that's the outcome most likely to happen, because I still think the, 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 dis, the discussions and the arguments with Hillary Clinton from the left, from what I can tell, are largely personal. And the more she campaigns with other Democrats, the more other Democrats talk about the importance of this election, the easier it is to bring them back right. to the fold. Right. I, don't, I think Trump's differences with the Never Trumpers are ideological. They are deep seated. They're based on principle. I think it's much harder for Trump to bring them back. Okay, so let's talk about the debate. We are now eight days away from the first debate. The lineups are set. It's going to be Trump versus Clinton. There will be no third party candidates unless there's some major development that we can't foresee. What are you guys looking for in terms of the debate and how it's going to affect the campaign? I, I'm going I'm to I'm going to speak against form here. But I think probably the best thing that happened to Gary Johnson was that he did not qualify for the debate, honestly. Um, really? Wow. Yes, I do say that because Johnson Preach. is, he's, he's, Johnson is, well, Johnson certainly is less polished of a politician than Clinton is. He will, if he had been on the stage, he would, he would probably be the most interesting of the three candidates, but he would probably be perceived as the more, as the most weird of the three candidates. The fact that he is not there means that as soon as that debate is over, for a large chunk of Americans who are not going to be who are not going to be satisfied by what they heard from the two major candidates, he can swoop in immediately. Whereas if he would have been on the stage, he would have had to have been judged against the two of them, and it might not have gone so well for him. Now, on the vice presidential debate, I think Bill Weld would have easily wiped the floor from a debate perspective with Mike Pence. I don't know necessarily about Tim Kaine. Tim Kaine's actually better debated than people think. But I think for the libertarian, I, I think it, I, I've always said Johnson needed to be missing from the first debate for the American people to recognize how badly they wanted him in the third and second debate. So I think this is actually better for him than if he had gotten into the first debate. You have sold me on that, DJ. I'll actually buy it. I'm going to say the best sure. thing that happened to Gary Johnson was that he made his Aleppo gaffe on Morning Joe and not on Bill O'Reilly's show. <laughs> and with uh, that... I, my, my last thing, I would like... It's just sort of a change of pace for this debate. I would like Lester Holt. I would like him wearing a toga on a reclining couch. And at the end of the debate, I would like everyone to be cheering and him to go like a thumbs up or a <laughs> thumbs down. <laughs> and then a voice at the end to go, finish him. <laughs> this now this now guarantees I will start the post-debate podcast with, Were you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Next week, we'll be doing a post-debate podcast, so look for that on Tuesday morning. Please send us your questions at moreperfectunionpodcast.com, where you can also find our blogs and host bios. Don't forget to rate us and review us on iTunes. And if you enjoy political debates and would like to be a part of ours, join us on Facebook in our political discussion group, Open Fire. We are all there, and we'd love to see you there, too. Until next week, bye-bye. We miss you, Emily. Finish him. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.